Mystery Theater. I'm E.G. Marshall. A good name in man or woman, the great poet tells us, is the immediate jewel of their souls. True enough. And how valiantly, even desperately, all of us would fight to preserve and protect a good name. But would you also do battle to preserve or protect a bad name? Look at it this way. Suppose a bad name was the only name you had. Suppose it were a name that would make you rich and famous. What then? Would you give it up? Having trouble? Uh, yeah. Thanks for stopping. Well, what seems to be the trouble? Well, uh, I think it's the carburetor. Well, let me take a look. Don't bother. Huh? I'm on to the game. You're working with Jim Kuwick, aren't you? What are you talking Don't about? Don't move. Mister, what are you pointing that gun at me for? I'm just going to kill you before you kill me. Kubik monkeyed with the carburetor, so I'd have to stop along here. Look, I figured you were in trouble, and I wanted to help. Well, if you're religious, I'll give you a couple of seconds to pray. You got it all wrong. You look like you were in trouble. I only want... Oh! <laughs> Our mystery drama, Hung Jury, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Howard Da Silva. They exist in every country. Here they are referred to as Middle America. They are the hard-working, sober-minded, respectable members of the community the guardians of its morality. And one of their vast number is the hero, or more properly, the protagonist of our play. His name is Henry Pollard. He's 40-ish, bald, a bit plumpish, and like the character in the classic popular song, you'd pass him on the street and never notice him. And the only reason you'll notice him now is because we shall take you into his house, a suburban split ranch, where we shall confront him in an after-dinner discussion with his wife. Henry? Uh, yeah? Uh, I'm afraid I did something you might not approve of this afternoon. Oh, there's not much danger of that. What was it? I... I volunteered you again. Did you? What for this time? Oh, the books at the church are so confused. And you said I would straighten them out. Oh, they need someone who... who's an accountant. I don't mind, Norma. You don't? Of course not. Well, I do. Now that I think of it, I, I... I just... Oh, dear. You're upset. Yes. Yes, I'm upset. Let me tell you why. Louise Farnham, head of the finance committee, called me and said, Darling, our books are absolute chaos. Could Henry be a doll and straighten them out? Well? I said yes. Without thinking. And then I said to myself, why? Why shouldn't I, Norma? I'm an accountant. You're not the only accountant in the congregation. Why don't they ever ask Seth Burton or Tom Mosley? Well... Whenever something has to be done, the automatic reflex action. Call on Henry Pollard. I don't mind. You've been extending yourself for ten years. In the church, the school, the charities. And where did it get you? Where is it supposed to get me? Oh, nowhere definite, I suppose, but I don't think you're getting any real satisfaction out of it. Well, that's not true, Norm. What's all this? Why are you so upset? Because you're being taken for granted, and... And I think that rankles you. I think you're bored with your life. Norma, darling! No, you're 40. You're not really getting anywhere. I've got a promotion coming up. You haven't made a mark on the world, and you think being active in the community will somehow do something. But it hasn't. Darling, 
I'm very content. You don't use that word at 40. It's men like you who eventually break out, do something rash, desperate. What can I do to convince you that I'm happy with the way things are? I guess I'm being silly. I'm not even sure I understand what I'm saying. Oh, I hope that's not the office. Darling, if they need me, they need me. Hello. Hi, Precious. Who is this? Oh, you're not alone. Yes, Mr. McTavish. I remember you. Can you get away? Well, aren't you supposed to be in Los Angeles? Oh, I missed you, sweetie. So I came home. Well, if you need the figures, I... Oh, the way you say figures really makes me feel sexy. I'm sorry you missed me at the office. Oh, Angel, I miss you everywhere. I can't get enough of you. No, you people cannot do the annual report unless I check it out. Uh, where are you staying? Oh, baby, the champagne is cooling nicely. I see. Well, look, uh, this kind of thing really cannot be permitted. <laughs> Pour it on. Suppose I weren't home this evening. Honey, I'd be so lonely. I think I'd die. Well, we'll have to make it short. But sweet. Save time. Make sure everything's laid out and ready for me. Oh. Do you have to go out this evening? Well, these are the West Coast people. They were supposed to be here at lunch. They claimed their plane was late or something. No. They have their presentation tomorrow afternoon. Oh, well, what's the use of complaining? Darling, suppose you'd refused. That's not in my nature. I'm worried about you. Why? There's absolutely nothing to worry about. Hello? Norma, did I wake you? No, dear. I've been waiting up. Well, that's why I called. This thing is going to take longer than I thought. Oh. I can't tell you how confused everything is. Will you be very late? I'm afraid so. Don't wait up for me. Of course I'm all right. You're letting these people take advantage of you. Well, I don't mind. Oh, Henry, sometimes I wish you would mind. You'd better get to bed, dear. Good night. Good night. Lover. Hey, how you doing? I need a hundred dollars. I gave you a hundred dollars a half hour ago. Oh, the bad man took it away from me. He kept making that little ball drop into black every time I said red. So I thought I'd fool him. I said black, and he made it drop red. Well, a luck will change. Can I have a hundred? Well, I, uh... Something wrong? You have such a funny look. I mean, a serious funny look. I... I don't have a hundred dollars. Oh, well, that's nothing. When we were in Vegas, you didn't have a thousand dollars that time either. But you just went ahead and asked Mr. Nightingale if everything was okay. Mr. Nightingale? Yes. You said they call him Mr. Nightingale because he sings such a sweet song. <laughs> well, it's just that uh, I'm in kind of deep. Oh, precious. You mean you won't give me a hundred dollars? Sure, I will. Sure. You just wait here. Well, Mr. Pollard, have a seat. Thank you. What can I do for you? Uh, I would like to extend my line of credit. Mm, credit, credit, credit. Whole world based on credit. Oh, well, let's check it out. Well, what are we checking out? Oh, we're completely up to date, Mr. Pollard. The dial on this telephone is hooked into a computer. In this little book, we have a roster of our customers' names, and besides each is his code number. And let's see, Parliament, Parliament. Yeah. Oh, yes. 091. And so we dial 091. And in practically no time at all, the computer prints out on this typewriter everything we need to know. No sooner said than done. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. I'm afraid we cannot extend you any more credit. But you said... You said my credit was unlimited. Yes, yes, we said that, and it's true. Your credit may be unlimited, but you... You're the one that's limited. Uh, I don't understand. Well, now, sir, you are an accountant, true? Yes. 
And so you, of all people, should certainly have an orderly sense of finance. You owe us a total of twenty thousand dollars. Twenty? Mm, it adds up, doesn't it? Fifty here, hundred there, thousand another time. But I Yes, you don't remember, of course. This is the safe limit of your credit. And of course we must now discuss a means of payment. Twenty thousand dollars? I don't have anywhere near that kind of money. Mr. Pollard, I am not a moralist. I won't say to you, if you can't lose, don't play, or if you can't pay, don't borrow. Eh, it's all spilled milk, water under the bridge, locked for the door of the empty barn. But where can I possibly get $20,000? You have $20,000. We've checked you out. And that's how we set your limit. But where? You have a fine Persian rug on your floor in excellent condition. Bring at least $1,900. Yes, but that... I'm showing you where this $20,000 exists. Now, you have an antique silver service set, which I have appraised at close to $1,100. What are you saying? How do you We know? chose a propitious time to enter your home and consider the contents... And these, plus other valuable items, total $10,000. But I can't sell... For the other ten, you can take a second mortgage on your house. <laughs> you see? The money does exist. But uh, all the furniture and valuables you're talking about belong to my wife. Of course. And, and the mortgage, the house, we own it jointly. I couldn't raise money without her consent. And here you were saying you had no money. But I can't ask my wife to... Why not? Well, be... Because what could I tell her? The truth. How? How can I tell her the truth? Sir, what kind of marriage do you have? She... She'll divorce me. In which case you'll divide your property down the line and your half will be enough to satisfy your debt. Huh? How can I tell her I've been gambling and, and that I had another woman? No, you don't have to tell her about the other woman, just the gambling. I... I can't tell her. You will. You will. Just a matter of choosing the right time. <laughs> There's never a right time for... Oh, yes, 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 there is, there is. And you pick it. Would you rather go home and tell her now? Or would you rather tell her after we break your legs. His name may be Mr. Nightingale, but the song he sings is more fitting for a vulture. Well, our friend Henry Pollard does not seem to have a pleasant set of alternatives. But there's no way to avoid the choice. And so, he will decide as soon as I return in just a few moments with Act Two. When a man walks what is called a straight and narrow pathway all his life, the law of averages insists that he will have to fall off eventually. And the distance he falls is usually related to how firm was his step in the first place. Henry Pollard must have been treading very lightly because he has fallen all the way. I can't do it. I can't tell Norma. Then there may be another alternative. Steal it. Steal it from your company. Steal it? I'm not a thief. Oh, yes, you are. You're willing to steal the money from me. And don't say that's different. I, I can't steal the money. Why not? You're an accountant. Oh, I don't handle money. I just keep track of figures. Well, then you just have to go home and test your marriage. Have you got my hundred, sweetie? Huh? My hundred bagers. Still call because I'll give you a kiss for each and every one of them. No. Let's go home. I don't want to go home. I want to play roulette. I don't have any more money. I know. That's why you went in to see Mr. Nightingale. He won't give me any more. Uh 
Uh-oh, you're broke. And in debt. Oh. Let's get out of here. Where can we go? Who cares? I care. What was all this you were telling me about being a free spirit, huh? Well, your spirit can be free, but everything else costs money. Well, let's just get in the car and drive, huh? And live on what? On my credit cards. It'll take them maybe a year to catch up with me, and then... Who cares? It's been nice knowing you, Henry. Julie. Henry, a girl has to be sure of the rent. But I can't go home. I can't. My name is Henry Randall Pollard. And I intend to take my life with this pistol. I commit this act because I don't have the ability to achieve success nor do I have the humility to live with failure. Nor do I have the courage to pull the trigger. No, I'm not afraid to die. I just am not willing to shoot. Because if I make it a suicide, then Norma and the kids will not collect the insurance. What I better do is have an accident. An automobile accident. Up ahead, huh? All alone. This hour of the night. He must have had a breakdown. No, I can't pass him by. I can do what I have to do later. Let me do a good deed before I leave this world. You in trouble? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks for stopping. I, I can't... I don't know. Something went wrong with the car. Well, I can give you a lift to the nearest phone or garage. Would you? Oh, that would be fine. Uh, my name is Barrington. Elmer A. Barrington. I'm Henry Pollard. Well, this is so kind of you, Mr. Pollard. So very kind. Uh, could you uh, drop me off at a motel? I, I'd like to spend the night there and uh, worry about the car tomorrow. Sure. <laughs> Sufficient end to the day that... Troubled there, too, as they say. Hop in. Just got a few things I want to take with me. This uh, bag and my attache case. Uh, uh, that's about all. Now I'll just run up the windows and lock the doors. Let me give you a hand. No. Don't you touch that case. What? Huh? I only wanted to help. Put it down. Well, sure. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I see it all now. This is the way it was supposed to be. Kubik arranged for my car to stall out on the turnpike. Then you happen along as if by coincidence and kill me. And take the money. That's an old trick. Will you please tell me what you're talking about? Oh, yes. It's the last trick you'll ever try. Hey, what are you going to do with that gun? You can't kill me. Oh, but I can. I kill very well. Look, mister. Because I have an instinct. A hunter's instinct. A killer's instinct. I smell, I sense death and murder. Look, all I wanted to do was help you. And before I kill you, I must tell you why your little scheme failed. I had no scheme. You were overmatched. You and my idiot servant, Kubik. I don't know anybody named... This is the last minute of your life. And you should know why your amateurish plan was doomed from the start. Believe me. I've lived here in America 30 years. Look at me. Listen to how I speak. I'm an American. That typical American, no? But my name isn't Barrington. It's von Barenheim. I killed a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. Who can count them? I pacified Warsaw for my fear. The others, Goering, Himmler, Goebbels, Streicher, all dead. All gone, except me. Me, one they call the werewolf of Warsaw. And now, you're dead, too. <coughs> He pulled the trigger, but the gun misfired. 
I jumped him. He may have been a killer in his day, but that day was over. He was now an elderly man. He kept pulling the trigger, but I was able to push the gun against him. And when it finally went off, the bullet killed him, not me. Ironic. Why had I struggled? Why didn't I let him kill me? I had wanted to die. Or did I? And he had said something about money. I opened his attaché case. It was filled with bills. Twenties, fifties, hundreds. In neat bundles. I felt absolutely no remorse. It wasn't as if I'd killed a, a decent person. He was, after all, a Nazi war criminal. And why should I involve the police and try to explain and... Why not, why not just take the money, bury the attaché case a few miles down the road, and go home? Go home. Pay off Mr. Nightingale, and never stray off the straight and narrow path again, because well, maybe this was the way Providence chose to reward me for, for being a good citizen who had only made one little mistake. Will you be home for dinner again this evening, Henry? Of course. I come home every night, don't I? Well, yes, dear. This past month. I had to slow down. I've been working too hard. No more night sessions at the office. I'm glad you don't drive around so much at night anymore. Say, you know that night you came home late? Hmm? I think it was the last time you stayed at the office. A man was murdered on the turnpike? Yes. Yes, I... I think I remember. Well, they caught the murderer. They what? Who? Who is he? Henry, you look so so pale. Well, I don't blame you. You passed that spot just before or just after it happened. It might have been you. Who? Who's the murderer? Well, he's not the murderer yet. Not until he's convicted. But the suspect is a man named James Kubik. James Kubik? Yes. He's been arrested and charged. And they don't do that unless they're pretty sure, do they? James Kubik. Now what do I do? Do I say that Mr. Kubik is innocent? Do I come forward and present myself as the killer of Mr. Elmer A. Barrington? I... I should. And if I were everything I claim to be, that people think I am, I would. But I'm not what I claim to be. If I were, I'd never have gotten into this thing in the first place. But how can I let an innocent man... Well, maybe a jury will acquit him. No point in my being hasty. Just wait and see what happens. Was there any mail today, dear? Yes. I was going to call you at the office, but... Well, you received a summons for jury duty. I, I'm i on the panel. Do you know who can get you out of it? Oh, why should I want to get out of it? Louise Farnham's husband, Howard. It's about that... Did you just ask why would you want to get out of it? You can get stuck with a murder case and be tied up for weeks. Even months. Well, but it's the duty of every citizen. Certainly. Therefore, let somebody else do it. No, dear. I'm afraid I'll have to accept my obligation. Mr. Pollard, you are aware of the fact that you're under oath. Yes. My name is Victoria Ullman. I am the attorney for the people. Do you know me? I do not. Do you know the defendant, James Kubik? No. His attorney, Mr. Kenneth Hayes? No. His honor, Judge Wilson? No. Did you know the deceased, Mr. Elmer Barrington? No. Do you know any of the jurors so far selected? No. Then you are not acquainted with any of the parties so far involved in this trial? That's right. And have you formed any opinions on the matter? No. You understand you will be sequestered for the duration of the trial, unable to go to your office by day or to your home at night? Yes. Your Honor, the people find Mr. Henry Pollard acceptable. 
I knew the questions were a matter of form. All the time she was talking to me, she was looking at me, trying to determine, maybe to guess, if I could be fair, or if I could even be prejudiced in her behalf. I breathed a sigh of relief. I was halfway home. I wanted to be on this jury. I wanted to be on this jury more than anything else in the world. But Mr. Hayes, the defense lawyer, he scared me. Mr. Pollard, the defendant's name, Kubik, does it suggest an ethnic origin to you? I, uh, uh, well, perhaps. What kind of origin? Oh, European. What kind of European? What kind? I'm not sure. Would you suppose it to be Slavic? Yes, I would suppose so. Hmm. Uh, do you have any feelings, one way or another, about people with foreign-sounding names? No. He looked at me very closely, very carefully. He was coming to a decision. I couldn't say a word. What I wanted to tell him was, pick me. Pick me. I'll see to it that your client goes free. I know he's innocent. Choose me. <sighs> but of course, I couldn't say that. I couldn't say anything. I could only wait and hope. Hope that somehow he would read something in my voice that would make him say, yes. It seemed he regarded me for an hour. But it had to be much less than a minute. Finally, he said, Your Honor, Henry Pollard is acceptable to the defense. Acceptable to both the people and the defense. We have Henry Pollard, now a juror, sitting in judgment. We know what no one in that courtroom even remotely would dare to suspect. That juror number six, Henry Pollard, is the killer. And not the defendant, the accused, James Kubik. How can justice possibly be served here? Well, you know that justice always triumphs. When I return with Act Three. been observing the workings of fate on the life of one Henry Pollard. Henry Pollard is a typical citizen, outwardly. But inwardly, we are aware of other things. Henry has led two lives. One, a safe, sober, uneventful suburban existence. The other has seen him violate at least five of the Ten Commandments. Now, both lives come together in a courtroom where Henry who has committed murder, is not in the prisoner's chair where he belongs, but in the jury box. And we will prove that the defendant, James Kubik, did, with all malice aforethought, plan and execute a scheme to murder his employer, Elmer A. Barrington. As she started to talk, I looked at the defendant very carefully for the first time. He was about my age, small. He had shifty eyes, which I suppose was not in his favor. He had a, a nervous manner, which didn't help either. But he had a right to be nervous. He was on trial for his life. I wanted to tell him, don't worry. I won't let you pay the bill for me. You're safe. I'll swing this jury for you. Mrs. Bronson... You are, were, Mr. Barrington's housekeeper. That's absolutely correct. You worked for him for how long? Fifteen years. And what kind of a man was he to work for? A saint. What business was Mr. Barrington engaged in, Mrs. Bronson? He bought and sold. What? Anything. Everything. Stocks, bonds, houses, business. He was a very sharp, shrewd man. And was he accustomed to carrying cash with him in large amounts? Oh, yes. Thousands of dollars in that attache case of his. And when I'd say to him, Mr. Barrington ain't that dangerous, 
he'd say, well, I got cubic to protect me. <laughs> Some protection that one turned out. The pistol he was carrying the night he was shot. The one that killed him, lying there on the table. Do you recognize it? Yes, ma'am. Belongs to Mr. Kubik. Will you tell us what happened the night of the murder? Well, Mr. Barrington had just got a phone call. And he said, I have to go upstairs and get my attache case. Get hold of Kubik and tell him he has to drive me. Where's Kubik? I, uh, am right here, Mr. Barrington. Now what's the matter with you? Well, I, you look like hell. Been drinking again? Oh, no, 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 sir. I just feel sick. Well, I can't let you drive me if you're sick. Is the convertible okay to take? Uh, yes, sir. I fixed the carburetor. Now, come out with me and make sure. Mr. Barrington, I'll need some money to pay some food bills tomorrow. Oh, well, wait a minute. I got some here in my case. Will a hundred dollar bill cover it? Yes, sir. He opened that briefcase, and it was chock full of money. Well, I'd seen it before, so it didn't faze me none. But Kubik's eyes, they shone like floodlights. And then Mr. Barrington and the defendant left the room. When did you see Mr. Kubik again? Mm, say half an hour later. I was in the kitchen. I thought you'd gone to bed. Yeah, I can't sleep. Where are you going? You mean I got to check in and out to you? I thought you were sick. I got to go out and get some air. You mean some booze? Yeah, I got to get rid of a headache. Maybe if you went on the wagon. Oh, this is a good little thing you got here. You keep telling the boss I'm a loss and... The... How can you get all them hangovers? I got headaches. From booze? No. From the boss. He can drive you crazy. One day, I am going to kill him. I believe you would, too. Ah, shut up. Where are you going? I said I was going out. Now, Mr. Kubik, you walked out to the garage with Mr. Barrington. Yes, I did. And you checked out the carburetor of the convertible? Yeah, I did that. And then you claim you gave him the pistol. Yes. Ordinarily, you would carry the pistol because you were also his bodyguard. Well, uh, yes, but I wasn't driving him that night. No one saw you give this pistol to Mr. Barrington? Well, nobody else was there. So we only have your word for it. Why would I lie? Why, indeed. Were you aware of the fact that Mr. Barrington carried large sums of money on his person? I didn't know what he carried. It was all in that case. Mrs. Bronson has just testified that Mr. Barrington opened the attaché case in your presence and that it was filled with bills. I, I did not see it. I mean, I mind my own business. Somebody opens a private briefcase, I don't snoop to see what's inside. But what have you to say to the testimony given by Mrs. Bronson that you threatened to kill Mr. Barrington? I didn't threatened to kill Mr. Barrington. Did you say, one day I'm going to kill him? Well, did you? No. You didn't say it? But I... I did not mean it. I, I, I mean, w w why? Why would I kill him? Because he was strict. Because he may have insisted on a better job from you. Everybody says something they don't mean sometimes. Don't you... Don't you ever get mad at somebody? It was going from bad to worse. When you sit on a jury, you know how things are being taken by your panel mates. You can tell, well, by the way they breathe, the way they listen, the way they pay attention or, or pretend to pay attention. You can tell everyone's already leaning one way or the other, and they were leaning, leaning toward conviction. Unfortunately, it was, he was a terrible witness for himself. Didn't Mr. Barrington threaten to fire you? No. Uh, yes. And isn't it true that the real reason he kept you is because you were willing to work for low wages? Well, I... Uh, Why were you willing to be underpaid, Mr. Kubik? Well, uh, 
jobs are hard to get. Especially for a man with a criminal record. To compound the damage, Kubik had served time for assault. He had almost killed a man. There may have been some justification, but I could see he was gone. And yet, I couldn't let him pay the bill for me. Or could I? But what could I do? Stop the trial and step forth and confess? No, I, I couldn't do that either. And then, then it occurred to me, there was a way. He would be found guilty, but I could make him a hero. He would get off easily. All I had to do was somehow get word to his counsel. Your Honor, I wish to recall the defendant to the stand. I do this because we've come into possession of a piece of evidence which casts an entirely new light on this case. Mr. Kubik, you came to this country from Poland? Yeah. While in Warsaw during the war, had you ever heard of a man named von Barenheim? My memory ain't so good. Uh, uh, you were an officer in the Polish army, were you not? Yeah, I think I was a lieutenant. I don't really remember. When the Nazis overran Poland, Special Gestapo execution squads hunted down most of the Polish officers. I think that's what happened, but I, I, I don't remember. I was in prison. I, I, I find it hard to remember. I get headaches. The leader of the execution squads was Colonel Fritz von Barenheim. He was known as the werewolf of Warsaw. Do you remember him? People think I get drunk all the time, but it's just that I have these headaches. He was a war criminal. Hundreds of thousands died because of his atrocities. Now, we have been able to determine that this von Barenheim escaped to America and changed his identity to Elmer A. Barrington. I, I got a headache now. But you, one night you recognized him. Something happened. He gave himself away. Filled with completely human, absolutely understandable desire for revenge, in a fit of emotion you simply could not control, you killed him. No. I did not kill him. You killed him to avenge your dead and tortured countrymen. I never killed anyone. The air was changing in that jury room. I could smell it. They were leaning forward and looking at him now. For the first time, they saw him as a human being. I glanced at the lady on my left. A tear was running down her cheek. But the idiot, he was too stupid to see his only chance was to confess. Confess, you fool. Confess, and you're a hero. His lawyer was working desperately to make him see it. It doesn't lessen your guilt, but it makes it human. Thou shalt not kill, the book tells us. But how do we answer those who understand only death and murder? You're a hero. You've avenged a million crimes. Your name will go down in history as the Avenger of Warsaw. I... I would not kill anybody. This... This stupid, cringing coward. He was being offered immortality. And he didn't have the courage to accept it. He would have a place in history. He would be somebody. But he sat there just stammering, stuttering. Until finally, the idea seemed to percolate somehow into his brain. You need not be ashamed, Mr. Kubik. Oh, well, I... Confess proudly. Accept the blame, but also the glory. Yes. Yes. I recognized him! Confess? To what can he confess? I killed Barenheim. Me, I did it. It's my glory, not his. It's my immortality, not his. Why should he be known as the destroyer of the werewolf of Warsaw? The avenger of the innocent martyrs? I'm the one who killed Barenheim. Tell us 
Mr. Kubik, tell the court in your own words how you recognized this infamous monster. No, no, that glory, that credit, it belongs to me. I won't give it away. I won't give up a place in history. I won't. It's mine. Tell us, Mr. Kubik. He can't tell you anything. You know why? He didn't do it. I'm the one. I killed Baron Hines. What are you saying? Listen to me, everybody. I killed him. You see, I recognized him from an old picture in a magazine. I never forget a face. I killed him. You don't believe me? I'll show you where I hid the attaché case. That'll prove it. Prove that I, Henry Pollard, killed the werewolf of Warsaw. Let the whole world know that I killed him. And the whole world did. And Henry Pollard became a hero. Of course, he went to jail because some of the suspicious-minded people on the jury, another jury, the one that was impaneled to try him, wanted to know what had happened to the money. But there are still those who see him as a man of the purest motives. My only motive is to return here in a few moments. A good name is a treasure, but a bad name can also hold a certain value. We live in an age of merchandising, and any product is saleable if you know how to package it. Right here, at this position on your dial, you can have seven exciting and suspenseful packages each and every week. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Catherine Byers, Joan Shea, Bob Dryden, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>